knowledgeable person, uh, full of wisdom, and inshallah he will be uh, sharing with us uh, his wisdom. And also, <coughs> Imam Dawood is one of the founding members of INSNF. He has been around from uh, the beginning. So, almost the beginning. Uh, in Masjid Taqwa, Parker Masjid. And then also, he played a crucial role uh, in building this masjid in the early 90s. And if you guys see the pictures uh, of that construction, you will definitely find uh, Imam Dawood in there as well. So, inshallah, Imam Dawood, if you can give us a short intro about yourself, let us know who you are. I thank Imam Khalil for such a generous introduction. I'm really just a guy, you know. Uh, I, um, I'm from Buffalo. I was born in Buffalo and uh, educated there. I uh, graduated from high school at 17 years old uh, and I went right into the military. I went to the United States Air Force and I wound up being stationed in Germany for three years. And uh, I got interested in uh, Islam. I went to a Christian family and I got interested in Islam. Uh, when I was a freshman, uh, a guy came to town uh, by the name of Malcolm X, who I, I had no idea who it was. And a friend of mine was going, he said he was going to hear Malcolm X. I was like, who's Malcolm X? What kind of name is that? He said, I don't have time to explain, just come on, come along. And so I went, I was about 13, 14 years old, and that changed my life. Um, uh, when I got out of the service, I was kind of, you know, fast forward. I accepted Islam in 1969. Um, and uh, a few years later, that's when Masjid Taqwa, a couple of years before, they brought the building in. Park, and we started going and studying and whatnot, you know. And, um, in 1978, I was uh, asked to go to the first uh, Imam training program uh, sponsored by Dar Iftar Saudi Arabia uh, uh, in Naperville, Illinois. And uh, that's where I met Imam Siraj Rahaj, Imam uh, Alameen Abdul Latif. And uh, my, my, most of the, you know, the established imams were in this, involved in this program. There were 48 of us. And after the 40 days in April, well, there was four months in Saudi Arabia where the Hajj was made. And, uh, that's where I got my first hijaz of uh, permission to say something about this. Uh, and I became uh, a Muslim chaplain in the Department of Corrections um, in the 90s. And I worked there for about 18 years until I retired in 2006. So. And also I'm associated with the, probably one of the oldest uh, Islamic organizations in, in the United States, the Dina Lahi Universal Arabic Association, mm -hmm. which was incorporated in New York State in 1938 under the leadership of uh, Professor Muhammad Izzedine, Rahimahullah. Um, it was a national organization with uh, chapters in New York State, New Jersey, Florida, Michigan, uh, they were pretty busy. And uh, one of these uh, well-known, most well-known communities that he established at the Imam of is called West Valley Area, West Valley, probably heard of West Valley, which is about by Springville. It's a rural, uh, land-based Muslim community, 300 acres, where the Muslims in the uh, 40s and 50s back then, they moved from Buffalo, built their homes, built a mosque, built a school, and started becoming self-sufficient, you know, farming, commuting in Buffalo to work. And they were pretty industrious. And uh, so we're in the process of rebuilding that community now because the way it declined after almost 100 years. So anyway, what I'm here today is to talk about is social justice. You know, I do a I thank him for the invitation, you know. And uh, we always have a good time here. There's a lot of history here, uh, 
so for the sake of time, I'm going to ask Imam Khalil to recite uh, just the first nine ayat of Surah Rahman. You see what happened, eight and nine will set up the whole uh, idea of what we're talking about today, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء That's 
So uh, actually, the Quran has a lot to say about uh, about about justice. And uh, one of the reasons that I asked Imam to recite those items, uh, anybody see the, the, the movie Lion in the Desert with, uh, I think, Anthony Quinn was playing uh, the role of Mukhtar? Omar Mukhtar. Omar Mukhtar, right? I haven't seen it. It's an, old, it's an old movie, but Lion in the Desert, talking about the Libyan struggle for uh, against the Italian colonizers. And in the beginning of it, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Mukhtar is sitting like this in Tali, he's got young students, and he's teaching the Quran, and uh, he's teaching in this surah, and uh, when he gets to the ayat, la tukhzir al-nizan, la tukhzir al-nizan, he stops, and he looks at his students, and his eyes kind of fall back in his head, and then the next scene, they're fighting. <laughs> You know what I mean? It, it, you know, he says, it hits him again. We have to, this is not right. The Italians have occupied you know, uh, the country and uh, they're oppressing the Muslims and so forth and so on. This is cause for jihad. Uh, so actually, Allah subhanahu wa in many places, I just picked this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa he was calling us to justice uh, and be witnessing for the truth for Allah subhanahu wa even if it's against ourselves or our relatives or near, near kin. Whether one is rich or poor, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has better right over all of this. So we've commanded, and, and also I say that, you know, when we read the Quran, when we hear this, the phrase, Ya Ayyuladina Amu, we should take it personally. You know, we should feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing me personally. You know, uh, this, this is, this is, this is, uh, usually we get an order, we get a command. Ya Ayyuladina Amu. Uh, some, so many, you know, some, some important information is coming when we say, when we hear, Ya Ayyuh it, it says, listen up, this is for you. And take it personally. And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is personally giving us a personal invitation or command to be firm in justice. Uh, actually, it working and advocating for justice is a sunnah of all the messengers and prophets, especially the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then just one ayah here talking about how all the messengers were sent with clear proofs and and, and scripture and nizam again, justice, so that man can man can maintain the justice. This is our job. And some example, examples of the, of the Prophet said, he said uh, even before he was uh, visited by Jibreel at least, and given the message of, of prophethood, he was involved in, uh, even you heard about the, he was involved in the war of the Fijar at age of 15 or 16. And um, one time, some, some people came back with, with, a, with a trading center, and People used to come there to trade. So one time there were some people came, they got robbed, right? And they got their goods misappropriated. And they went to the leaders of Mecca and they asked for redress or return of their goods and they were not given it. So some of the people uh, of, of the town you know, of Mecca said, this is not right, we have to do something about this. And so Hillsborough Fudel was, was formed to protect the rights of, of the travelers and the poor and to prevent people from being prayed upon. And there are other examples uh, treated uh, later on after the, after the Hitra. Uh, well, actually, when the Prophet said when he went to Medina from Mecca, you know, he, he made peace and tried to set the scales right between the warring factions there. Then, uh, when, when they were trying to make Hajj at the Daibia, uh, he was given permission to make highs in the Mecca and stopped him. They made uh, an agreement to keep peace. He did call it Khodaibia, which a lot of the companions didn't like that agreement, you know, because uh, the Mecca were very harsh and very unreasonable about everything. And finally, when, 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 when the Las Fadala granted uh, success in Mecca to the, to the Muslims and the Prophet Muhammad, he came in and he was very. Uh, 
amenable, very, he, he did not exact revenge, he didn't oppress anybody, even though they had oppressed him, he actually, they actually had run him out of town. They, they had killed his uncle and his other relatives, and he had been attacked and blamed and tied, and you know, you know the story from the Sierra, and you have a, uh, a series coming up, uh, which is going to go more in detail into Sierra. I think we have two sessions, right, on Sierra, going into more detail. Uh, but today we want to focus on the, on the examples of previous prophets and messengers who advocated for justice, which they all did. But we're just picking out a few of them, uh, you know, to show uh, the continuity of the quest for justice among all the Andia. Uh, here at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, approximately translation is say, O oh believers, we have believed in Allah and what has been revealed to us and what has been, re been revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and descendants and what we was given to Musa and Isa and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinctions between any of them and we are Muslims in submission to him. There's a commonality among all the messengers and prophets. Um, the commonality in their characteristics. They shared the characteristics of being human beings. They were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to convey his message. They were all men of extremely high moral, spiritual, and intellectual capacity, quality. And they didn't seek this status, but they were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which makes an interesting point about the political, you know, these days in the in the, in the politics of the country, we see people vying and doing whatever they think they need to do to, to maintain a position or, or get elected, you know, uh, seeking the proof of people, uh, whatever. Uh, in Islam, the one who politics for a position, who wants a position of leadership, he should be the last one to get it. You know, the one that we want is the one who, he doesn't really want to be a leader, but the people, you know, Anybody, anybody who wants to be like a leader is crazy. You know, those of us who've been in leadership for a while, you know, we look, as, as, as for me, uh, I've been called Imam for some years now, but I tell people I wish, I would rather be the Muslim than the Muslim. Because the Prophet Solomon, he says, he says that on the Yom Piyam, Muslim, Muslim, they will have the longest necks. You know, Muslim is safe, you know. He doesn't get brave for anything. <laughs> Imam is blamed for everything, you know. You know, funny thing about communities is when things are going well, you know, uh, people, you know, like, uh, you know, this masjid, how many of you seen it go from a little, you know, this 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 organization started, how many people here go to UB? Okay. Did you know that the, uh, the ISNF started on as, as a, a UB as a, as a MSA chapter? How many people knew that? Yeah. In the 60s, there was a group of students like you at MSA who started having Yuma. They formed the MSA. And then, sometime later, you know, they formed the ISNF. Dr. Aftab Khan, did you know how I knew Dr. Dr. He wrote the first uh, constitution. And anyway, they, then came Parker and then blah, blah, blah. So, what I'm saying is that people can't, I came to the, I came to the, Grand opening of the masjid, you know, everybody was happy, you know, everybody was like, everybody take the ownership, look what we did. But, but if, there, if there had been a glitch, if it hadn't happened, or, or, or if, you know, something went wrong, then, you know, everybody would take ownership of that. You know, who's the leader over there? Who's the president? What's wrong with him? You know? But so the characteristics of the prophets that they, they, didn't, they didn't want it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, yes, no, you have Musa, you have no, you, you, this, I have job for you. And the other thing important that none of them betrayed the message. Uh, the methodology was that they all taught the same message of la ilaha illallah, submission of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They all emphasized tawheed because shirk is the greatest loom. The greatest thing we talk about is social justice. A Muslim at the back of his mind is that yeah, the murder and police brutality and all these things are wrong. But the greatest wrong, according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa is this shirk. This is the greatest wrong. Um, can you just touch a little bit about, uh, you said about the leader,
Well, uh, leadership in Islam is something uh, something quite different. And we take the example of, 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 of the Prophet Solomon. You know, he was uh, he was anointed with certain characteristics from even from Java. You know, that by Allah's time without. You know, I've always felt that people got the leaders that they that, that they deserve. Uh, we are, Islam, you know, is not a, a democracy. It's not a theocracy, but it has the best qualities of both. It's something completely different, you know. And then um, we believe that leadership should be the right of the people. You know, the people, the people should, you know, no leadership should be forced on the people. Uh, unfortunately, we, and all the we, we have all these Muslim countries today, and we we, we can hardly find an example of really Islamic leadership, Islamic order. You know, we have kings and princes, and you know, stuff. You know, we have we have Muslim countries attacking other Muslim countries. You know, you know Saudi Arabia attacking Yemen, for instance. You know, I mean, what kind of leadership is that? Who's, who, who, who authorized that? You know, the Prophet says says that, that Muslims' blood is honor. You know, and and his reputation, his property is sacred to another Muslim. You know, we never attack attack a Muslim. You know, I mean, this is this is this is not leadership. And so leadership should be based on the Quran and Sunnah, and the people decide which person's knowledge is important, who's more knowledgeable in the Quran, who's more knowledgeable in the Sunnah, and not only knowledge but the practice of the knowledge, the application of it. Who's actually practicing? Because a lot of people know a lot of stuff, but they don't do much about it. You know. I remember I used to teach in this masjid, uh, universal school, and we would teach the kids about, you know, you have to pray, you have to make salat, you have to get up in the morning, you know, and if you don't, you know, Allah's upset with you. And uh, some of the kids would say, well, my dad, he doesn't do that. <laughs> dad never prays, you know, they don't, you know. So they know, but they don't do. So leadership is based on a combination of having knowledge of the right thing, and also putting it into practice and then sincerity. It's the same, some of the things that we see that we find in, in the prophets that they, and they were sincere to the message. And finally, understanding that the duty is only to convey the message. We just, we can't force things on people, you know. Like the Lost Man uh, uh, told the prophets they said in the Quran, for that year, that year, Less the Ali be like He said, warn them, you are only a warner. Less the Ali, you are not a, a warner or a guardian over the people. So our job is to bring the message to the people. And then the people decide, inshallah. The Prophet Nuh Ali said, I was the first example, you know, many things, a big, big story about him, you know, and, and the interesting thing about Noah is that his story is almost the same in the Quran as it is in the Christian scripture. And that he was an ancient prophet. He was a person who was sent for his people. His people were, were, were mushriks, and they were a lot of stuff to learn from his story. Uh, uh, they were first adopted. Idol, they were the first big idol mushrik, mushrikim. And Noah was one of the great prophets and messengers from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who he imposed that. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala chose Noah to preach to his people for almost 1,000 years. That's a great lesson for us. We should not be impatient in trying to spread this message. He's a man who taught for over 900 years, you know? And finally, uh, after all that time, only a handful of people, you know, were with him. And when Allah SWT decided to punish those people, you know, then uh, he just had a few people, and most of the people were dropped, even his own family. His own son, you know, which teaches a lesson that sometimes even within a family you can have a divide. Sometimes husband and wife are not on the same page, you know, it's not, you know, mother and daughter, father and son, you know, not necessarily on the same page. When you, when you go to Syria, you see that the Prophet of Syria was opposed most of them by his own family, his uncles, you know, uh, Abdullah and his wife are mentioned specifically in the Quran. Well, that's one that I actually condemned him to the fire. Uh, so, in short, Noah's so important that he's mentioned 44 times in the Quran. 
and uh, more than 100 verses, I think 115 verses relate to him and his people. And sewer number 71 is named for Noah, who was standing for justice against his people. Um, there's some more information about Noah. You can read it, you know. Uh, I think you probably know it, uh, most of this stuff already. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep moving. To Prophet Ibrahim Ali Salaam and Israel, peace out. And as you know, uh, last week we had Eid al Adha, which is all about these two. You know, it's all about Ibrahim Ali Salaam and Israel and the sacrifice. And all around the world, people have, you know, gone out and slaughtered meat. Uh, it's about sacrifice. And, uh, you know, the story of Ibrahim Ali Salaam, you know, he was from a young teenager, I think, he was fighting for justice. You know, he was opposing his father and his elders, and they were out one time, he wouldn't destroy the idols in the temple that they were worshiping. And when they came back and they said, who is it that made a mess in this temple like this? Uh, and he, when he destroyed the idols, he left the big one, and he put the ax that he used to destroy the idol around the neck of the big one. You know, the thing I love about this holiday, Eat a lot of time, is that most of the imams give the same kupa, the same, they tell the same stories. You've probably heard it a thousand times, but how he put the axe around the, uh, around the neck of the big idol, and, they, and when the people came back, when the elders in the town came back and uh, inquired about who did this damage, and they told Ezra, who was Ibrahim, the Islam's father, he said, Why don't you get your son? He's always criticizing our idols. We think he might know something about that. And when they, when they came and brought Ibrahim and said, you know anything about this mess in this temple? And he said, it looks to me like the big one did it. He's got the ax, you know? And so I said, oh, wise guy, you know? So uh, they decided to punish Ibrahim, you know, for that. And they built this huge fire, right? So far, so hot that they couldn't even get close enough to throw him, put him in it. So they built like a catapult, like a slingshot to throw him in the fire. And as he's flying through the air, Allah SWT sent two angels to Ibrahim Ali Salam and said, Allah SWT has given us permission to bring you along with us. Just pick him out of the air, something like when Isa Ali Salam was taken up. You can, you can come with us. You know, and not have to go that far. Ibrahim Ali Salam says, Hasmullah, wa nitma wa kil. He says, uh, most excellent is Allah as my provider, you know, and the one who favors me. In other words, I don't need help from angels. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to help me, uh, if he doesn't want me to go in the fire, let him do it himself. And, and, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to go in the fire, but he told the fire, be cool, look out for my servant, me. Great, great story. And after he stayed in there, some say 40 days, some say four months, we don't know. But when he came out, he came out on him. He was clean, he was not singed, he was not damaged, you know. And they asked him, how could you sit in that fire like that all that time and come out unscathed, you know? Um, fresh as a daisy, as you might say. And he said the classic statement, the time I spent in that fire was the greatest time of my life. These were the best days. And so, uh, for this reason, for his faith, for his steadfastness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Well, he took him as his khalil. This is khalil. And khalil means what? Khalil means, and they, they say it means friend of Allah. Khalil Allah. That's why I love the uh, Imam's name. You know, he took his name from that. You know, khalil Allah. The, the khalil means intimate, intimate friend. Not just normal friend. Intimate, like bosom buddy. Like very close, he loved him very much. And of course, you know, he built the Kaaba with the help of Ismail Ali, Islam, and a lot of things about uh, Ibrahim. The main story about he is how he left his wife, Hajar, and the little baby Ismail in the desert with very little provision. And from that, the city of Mecca was born. You know, uh, the details are you have to get her all about it. He, um, after the provision he ran out, Food and water, and how she was running between Safa and Marble, 
looking for sustenance, and she heard the baby crying. She had put him on a bush to keep him out of the sun, and he's crying and kicking his foot. She goes to check on the baby, and from where his foot was kicking, water's coming. Zap, zap. You know, uh, long story, but for the sake of time, he's my dad, he's a now. He's a big part of the heat because he was so willing to sacrifice himself. When his father came and told him, I see a vision where I'm sacrificing you, then, uh, and feel free to stop me anytime and ask any questions or correct me, please. Oh, uh, Ismail Ali Salam, when he came to his son, he said, I saw his vision. I think the lost pound of Allah wants me to sacrifice you as a sign of my faith. Ismail did not hesitate. He was ready. He said, let's, let's do it. He only said, I just have two requests. Number one, when you slaughter me, take my shirt off. Because when mom sees me, I don't want mom to see my bloody shirt because she's going to already be upset. But when she sees my bloody shirt, she'll be more upset. And turn your, and the other request was, when you do it, just turn my face away the other way from you because you're my dad. And I don't want you to have to see me suffer the pains of life and leaving my life. So, uh, and, and of course, they were, both of them were great advocates for uh, equity and justice, inshallah. The uh, story of Musa alayhi salatu I don't know if you can see the prompts, but uh, this uh, it kind of summarizes the story of Musa alayhi salam, how he was uh, he was miraculously saved in his childhood uh, from the pharaoh who was, a, who was an oppressor and the pharaoh was, was killing all the boys uh, that were being born because he had been warned by his spiritual advisors. He, did, he, was, he had the body of Israel as captives, as slaves. He was oppressing them greatly. And he was warned that there's going to come a, a leader from among them, a, a, a man child who will lead them out, who will fight you. And said, Well, I'll just kill all the boys that way. Whoever's coming will be gone. And so Musa's mother. You know, when he was born, she hid him away and uh, actually put him in a little boat, a little straw raft, and put him in the river, and he was fished out. And uh, this is like a miracle, you know. And he actually grew up in the Pharaoh's household. He was fished, he was saved by the, uh, the Pharaoh's wife's servant, I think, different versions of the story. But he actually grew up in the house, adopted son of the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't realize who he was. Um, uh, he went through a lot of trials and travails. Let's go to the next slide, goes we'll more into it a little bit. Um, I talked about Hubert Park and his, uh, mm -hmm. well, he ran out of batteries or something. Hello? Okay. Uh, most of the story of Musa, he's probably the most discussed uh, prophet in the Quran. There's a long, lot of information about him. Uh, but the, the, the basic takeaways of that, um, he was raised unlike uh, the basket that went down the river of the region, unlike the destination, and wound up in uh, Pharaoh's wife, fell in love with the baby. And he wanted to grow up uh, as an aristocrat, badly. And I see a, the wife of Pharaoh was a righteous woman, unlike the cruel and evil Pharaoh. Um, after the incident, Musa had a social justice incident with somebody who was being beat, you know, and he stepped in to stop the beating and he actually killed the person, just uh, trying to save somebody and he wanted to actually person and he died. <laughs> and so he, he he ran away from Egypt after this incident and he got married. And uh, later on he's on a journey, he saw this fire and he went to the fire and that's when the last one dollar spoke to him directly. He told him that there's no God but him that he died and Allah commanded him to worship, establish Salah. Musa after his mission started, we're fast forwarding because of a long story. 
he went to Allah SWT actually told him to go to Pharaoh and invite him to the truth. And uh, when he told uh, Surah al uh, he invited him to come and worship Allah with me. Let's, let's stop this fighting. Let's together worship Allah SWT. Pharaoh says, I don't know Allah, that's me. You want me to worship myself? You know? And so, uh, the punishment of Allah SWT descended on the Pharaoh and his people. The takeaways from the story is that it's important to always to rely on Allah SWT and Allah is our Razak, the provider. And that this story of Bani Israel shows us how believers always have to undergo trials. We're going to, it's not going to be easy. And the response to this trial should be steadfastness and belief and the ultimate wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most importantly, we should avoid the fate of Bani Israel. You know, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, constantly reminds us about uh, what happened to Bani Israel and the favors that he bestowed upon them and how they betrayed that, uh, those favors. So the question is, back to the whole concept of, of, of uh, justice, is it a real command? Uh, and the answer is here in the ayah, in Allah, Yahmaru bil Ali, wa lisaam wa ta'ad al qurba, wa yahad al fashayim al mufa, that Allah enjoys and he orders or enjoins justice and good conduct given to the relatives, giving, and giving to relatives he forbids for immorality and bad conduct and oppression. And that he, he warns us so that, so that as a reminder that justice is the job of the Muslims. You know. Now, the whole question, back to the original slide, what do Muslims do but the whole social justice movement that's going on, how, how they relate to it. What are our principles? Uh, if we join any movement or we're on campuses or whatever, or we're on the job or wherever we are, we should remember what our principles are. Our principles are the same principles of the Islamic State. A law is a sovereign. The law of the land shall be based on Quran and Sunnah. It should not be based on geographic, racial, linguistic, or other material concept, concepts that we will enjoy what's good, we will, Abad al maruf and al-Munka means to enjoy good and forbid evil, and that we'll strengthen bonds of unity and brotherhood among Muslims, and among other people too, non-Muslims, we, we want peace with non-Muslims too, and that the state, or the Islamic state of mind should guarantee necessities of life. Uh, basically, you could translate that to the next side, that one of the big goals of Islam is to, is to carry the final word of Allah and to attain adab, justice. Uh, this, this, uh, this, this other ayat here, uh, some people have said about this ayat, that this ayat is so important that uh, some other people said that if this, if this ayat had been, had been revealed to them, it would, it would uh, the day of that revelation would be declared as a, as a national holiday or something. The people, whole nations have accepted Islam on the basis of the strength of this ayah that Allah SWT orders justice and, and good conduct. For this reason, Allah has emphatically ordered all human beings, particularly a people of faith, to be upholders of Adal and this which is two words meaning basically the same thing. Uh, Jama'ah is the ultimate balances, balancer and enforcer of social justice and equality. You know, this, the, the, the Salah, they, they translate it as, as prayer, but really it's more than prayer. You know, Salah is a whole institution which brings us together. And we should, um, the brothers of course, should maintain the congregation of Salah because it's, it's more than prayer. It enforces a social order. It reestablishes our leadership. It organizes us. It gets us beyond things that normally separate us. You know, it gets us beyond, you know, who's black, who's white, you know, who speaks Urdu, who speaks Arabic, who speaks English. Uh, you know, all these things which normally would be barriers. Who's rich, who's poor, 
who's middle class, all these things go out the window when it's time to sell out, you know? And that's why the Mwazin, like I said, I love to be the Mwazin because Mwazin is the greatest calling to social justice and equity because when he says Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, he's established in fact that this is about, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say something about this man because he was uh, back over 60 years, almost 60 years ago, he was assassinated almost in, in, in the year 1920, 2025, maybe 60 years. So now it's what, about what, 58 years or 54 years since he was assassinated. Why? Because in the middle of the 20th century, he was saying that if America wants to solve its racial problems and its problems of inequity, you know, and prejudice and hate, it's called the DNA, you know, uh, the DNA of America is, 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 is racism. And he said if America ever hopes to solve the problem of racism, which is deeply embedded in its soul and its DNA, then it must look at the religion of Islam. It must really consider, they, in other words, he's saying they must become Muslims in so many words, if they have to accept Islam. Because Islam is the only thing which has historically erased the boundaries and the separations, the ethnic, the racial, the economic disparities in society. Not that the Muslims are perfect, far from perfect, but Islam is perfect, right? And so we judge Islam by Islam, not by the Muslims. If you try to judge the Islam by the, what the Muslims do, then, then you may not want to be Muslim. You know? But if you judge Islam on the merit of, on the merit of, of what Allah says and what the Prophet said, uh, then you, you, you understand how Islam is a panacea. It's a, it is the cure. And uh, there are many verses, ayahs in the Quran. And the last uh, khutbah of the Prophet said, seven, uh, he started out by talking about there's no superiority of a white or a black or a black or a white, Arab or a non Arab. Even before talking about in body of worship, that's the first thing he talked about. So that lets us know this is not a new problem. But the Prophet said so was giving us a solution back then. And this man, Al Hajj Malik of Shabazz, was uh, a great American hero that's not given, I don't think, enough credit. You know, for what he did. And he's embraced and quoted a lot by non Muslims, by socialists and by nationalists and this group and that group. But I think that we need to give him, as Muslims, uh, pay attention to things that he said, similar to Dr. Martin Luther King and others who fought for social justice and equity. But we have Allah SWT gave us our own American, homegrown American hero who was inviting people uh, toward Islam more than 50 years ago. So, this is my final slide. Uh, and I ended it with the ayat, uh, Surah Al Hajj, um, when Allah SWT says, Muslims are those who we establish in, in them in the land. They establish Salah, they give Zakat, they enjoy what's good, what's right, and forbid what's wrong, and to Allah belongs the outcome of all matters. Okay, so uh, I kind of skipped through this, these 19 slides because I really wanted, you know, the best part of any presentation to me is the Q&A and uh, commentary section. So uh, I'm going to stop now and ask for feedback or directions, questions, or, you know, arguments. We're going to argue.
Patrick Steele was here in, in, in Britain. Uh, Britain was not happy about it, you know, and so they fought. They had this war of 1812, and Fort Erie all around here was very important. And the land that the Muslims were blessed to have, you know, for the last 80 years, sits in a place where that was used for a lookout, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful place, inshallah, we'd love for you, everybody to come out and uh, support this place. You know, there's not many places in America that actually can be called a Muslim homeland. I mean, we have masjids, you know, and centers, you know, um, but, you know, they're usually surrounded by, you know, non-Muslims and, you know, that kind of thing. This is a, a community that sits on its own land, pays its own taxes, has its own edifice, you know, which like I said, a lot of the original, um, you can actually see if you put in your search engine, Muhammad Izzeldeen, E-Z-A-L-D-E-E-N, there's a lot of stuff online about him and his various communities, a lot of pictures and stuff like that, you know. And what they were doing, they, they, they actually had something called the United, United Islamic Societies of America that they, they started having conferences in 1942, where they call all the Islamic groups together, something like what Islam has done in modern times. But they were doing this 20, 30 years before that. Any other questions, comments? I put everybody to sleep, I'm sorry. I know it's early, it's Saturday morning. You'd rather be jogging. You had any joggers in here? Who jogs? Just one? No, oh, come on. Jogging. Yeah. Not yeah. no walk, but typically that. Yeah. I'm a cycler. I, I ride my bicycle. I used to jog, but the knees, after 50 years or so, the knees don't like that pounding too much. What are your, what are your ideas? I mean, what, how did you feel last year, you know, when uh, we had big demonstrations even in Buffalo, Lafayette Square, they actually had the, you know, they occupied Lafayette Square, you hear about it, you know, and they, uh, you, you know, how, how about Miles Carter? Who knows Miles? You know Miles? Huh? He, he came and uh, talked to us at the bonfire a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone came. Yeah, Miles was, yeah. Miles was in the middle of it, all that, you know, and Miles called me up. Uh, In the middle of all that, he said, he said, he said, no, no, what you say? I need some Muslims out here to help us protest, you know. Because most of the people protesting, you know, they, they, they were non-Muslims. Uh, most of them were actually Caucasians, you know, a lot of socialists. And he said, can we, can we get more Muslims down here? And I said, well, you know, we'll try, inshallah, but we need more, we need more events like this. You know, we need to educate the Muslims that, that yes, we actually should be involved in that. A lot of people don't even know Miles was a Muslim, you know. You know. Miles wasn't always a Muslim, though. you know. I gave him his first Quran. Hey, you know, now Miles is famous, you know. But we need, he's, he's an activist, you know. And, uh, but sometimes activism can be lonely, you know. And uh, I remember when I was going to UB back in the 70s, Tell them my age, that's okay. Uh, students were very active. I mean, the students actually took over the union, the student union. They occupied it and, and uh, was it, I think, the president and, you know, Hayes Hall that time where the president was, had to barricade and lock himself in his office because they were going to kidnap him. It was just students, it was something else, man. <laughs> they had to call the National Guard and take the cameras back, you know. And this is not unique. I mean, throughout the world, you find that students, you know, in, in, in Europe, in Italy, in France, and whatnot, students a lot of times, you know, uh, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and other places, students were leading that, you know, those college students. And, you know, after you get out of college and you get your degrees and you start working and get married and you get fat and whatnot, you know, you're not, you know, it's not the same, you know. But um, students have a big role to play, a very important role to play. And 
the student organizations, you know, that's why, you know, the one of the reasons that we have the student organizations on campus is because uh, before the, uh, the 70s and the 60s especially, they, were, they, they didn't have them. So the students were organizing themselves and doing what they had to do and having these protests and taking over buildings and setting stuff on fire and taking presidents hostage and that kind of stuff and burning up cars and stuff. And so after that, they came in and they said, well, listen, okay, i tell you what, let's get this more organized. We'll give you guys some money. We'll give you an office, you know, and uh, we'll give you some of the student fees and you can have activities, you can have concerts, you know. Yeah, but don't, don't, do, don't do that other stuff, okay? Don't, 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 don't burn up the street. Don't, don't take over buildings and that kind of stuff like that. In other words, it was kind of like the okay, placate and, and, and comes down there, organized it. And so students have done a good job in doing, you know, educational activities, philanthropic activities, and uh, a lot of stuff that, that have went up, but it started uh, almost like the civil rights movement in America. It started when people were just you know, acting up. And civil disobedience is what they call it in the civil rights movement. You know, or what John Lewis, the late John Lewis called getting into good trouble. You know, so sometimes it's necessary to shake up to shake up the plot. And this is consistent with 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 Islam. You know, Allah says that's why the whole concept of jihad is is misunderstood, you know, jihad doesn't always mean fighting. It doesn't mean, you know, warfare. It doesn't mean, uh, one of the worst translations for jihad is holy war. There's no holy war, you know. The only holy war in history has been the Christian crusades. It was, that was an unholy war, actually. It was an unholy war, but they call it holy war, where Christians were just murdering, killing, and spilling blood, you know, uh, out of venom and hatred because they're afraid of Islam and afraid of, afraid of Muslims, you know, uh, just wanting to kill him, you know. That's what holy war, which really was unholy war, means. Jihad means struggle and strife. To be a good student is, a, is an act of jihad. To be a good parent is, a, is an act of jihad. To be a good son or daughter is to be a mujahid. You know, be a good neighbor. You know, to, to, to give the Tao, you know, to have what you're doing now. Um, Saturday morning, you could be doing a lot of other stuff. In the middle of the summer, you know, could be on the beach, you could be this, doing this, you could be vacationing or whatever, you know, but you're sitting in the masjid, trying to expand your consciousness and your knowledge of the deen and to understand better what your responsibilities are, you know, by a loss of the Tao. And so this is a great thing. This is, this is, deserves a lot of credit, you know. May Allah SWT bless you all. I may bless, you know, uh, this is, continue to bless the society, the imam, and, and the officers and the board with the right guidance. And uh, may he bless your children and your grandchildren to, to, to go forth with this message as they understand these things. And I encourage you all to get involved with uh, the, the ICNA Social Justice Committee. Because we just covered a few points here, but they really have a very uh, evolved and well-developed social justice program. The best one that I've seen in, in terms of being organized and being, you know, proactive about stuff. It the social justice committee, you know. Uh, in fact, you hear about them, you, know, you hear more about their social justice committee of Ignan than you hear about Ignan, you know. They, and uh, one of the leaders is Imam Imam Khalid. Khaled Griggs, you can Google him up to Griggs, G-R-I-D-G-S, Imam Khaled Griggs out of North Carolina. Yes. Sorry, one of the reasons I mentioned the uh, question about um, the community, mm -hmm. I'm actually from Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm aware of uh, the Monster. You are? You are? Oh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they have a really nice community, um, very old.
could send your children outside and you could go out, the sisters can go outside and, and, and feel safe because you're not, you know, like when you step out of the mosque and you go on high road and you turn the corner, you, it's almost like being in enemy territory sometimes. It's like, are you going to the store? You know, you don't know who's this guy. It's just, it's, you know, it's, you know who, 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 but to be surrounded by Muslims and Muslim homes and Muslim institutions and other communities have, you know, I mean, Amish communities, they have something like this. You know, Native Americans, they have something, you know, in America. Uh, Yahweh, they have something like They have, uh, you know, habitats, what's called habitats. Tracts of land that are owned and operated by Muslims, they have everything they need right there. And you can, you, know, you don't have to go off to the land to have what you need. There's a, there's a, there's a few of them, you know, but we need more, especially in these days, a lot of danger, like uh, Buffalo or Texas, that have a, a, a record year for murders and killings and assaults. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we hear even Muslim men involved in some of these things, you know, uh, these crimes that are committed, people being arrested for atrocious things, and murders, rape, etc., etc., etc. So we, it, it's one thing we aspire to. And that's why. When they, went to, when they went from Mecca, from Mecca to Medina, this is what they were looking for, a safe place, a safe haven, inshallah. All right, so anything else? Any ladies have anything to say about you? MashaAllah.